न अधिनायक जय हे भारत भाग्य विधाता पंजाब सिंध गुजरात मराठा द्राविड उत्कल बंगा विंध्य हिमाचल यमुना गंगा उज्जल जल धितरंगा तव शुभ नामे जागे तव शुभ आशीष मागे गाहे तव जय गाधा जन गण मंगल दायक जय हे भारत भाग्य विधाता जय हे जय हे जय हे जय 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 हे May I request the chief guest, the guest of honor, and other dignitaries on the dais to formally commence the lecture by lighting the lamp and offer floral tribute to late Dr. L. M. Singhvi. I request Mrs. Anita Singhvi to present the chief guest, the Honorable Vice President of India, with a bouquet as a token of her appreciation and reverence, and formally welcome them. Thank you, Mrs. Singhvi. I request Ms. Ablasha Singhvi to present the guest of honor, the Honorable Chief Justice of India, with a bouquet as a token of her respect and gratitude, and formally welcome them. Thank you, Ms. Singhvi. I invite Professor Dr. C. Raj Kumar, founding Vice Chancellor, OP General Global University, to address this August gathering and share a few words about the great work and life of Dr. L. M. Singhvi. Chief Guests of the Day, Honorable Vice President of India, Sri Jagdeep Dankar, the Guest of Honor, Honorable Chief Justice of India, Dr. Justice D. Y. Chandrachud, Honorable Chief Minister of Delhi, Dr. Abhishek Manu Singhvi, Senior Advocate, Supreme Court of India, and members of the Singhvi family, Mr. Avishkar Singhvi Advocate, Honorable Judges of the Supreme Court of India, and Honorable Judges of High Courts present in this hall, Honorable Members of the Parliament, Shri Mr. Naveen Jindal, Honorable Chancellor and Benefactor of OP Jindal Global University, distinguished members of the bar, distinguished members of the legal fraternity and academia, distinguished members of the media and civil society, Honorable Attorney General of India, ladies and gentlemen. It is my great honor and privilege to welcome Shri Jagdeep Dankar, the Honorable Vice President of India, who has so graciously given his valuable time to this special occasion and to address this August audience. It was a delightful opportunity to meet him a few days ago, and I was deeply struck by his graciousness, humility, and I must say, a great sense of humor that is uncommon among people who hold lofty positions. I would like to extend a warm welcome with equal honor and privilege to Honorable Dr. Justice D.Y. Chandra Chud, the Chief Justice of India, for being with us and agreeing to deliver the eighth Dr. Eldam Singhvi Memorial Lecture. He has been a great source of inspiration for many of us in the field of law and has been widely respected in the entire world of law and justice for being among the most brilliant and thoughtful jurists. 
I would like to recognize the presence and extend a warm welcome to the distinguished members of the Singhvi family, especially Mrs. Anita Singhvi, uh, Ms. Abhilasha Singhvi, daughter of Dr. L.M. Singhvi. We are sorry to miss the presence of Mrs. Kamala Singhvi since she is not in a position to visit public places, but her wishes are indeed with us. We are delighted to welcome Dr. L.M. Singhvi's younger brother, Mr. G.M. Singhvi, who has traveled all the way from Calcutta to be with us on this special occasion. This is a great moment of honor for me, as from this year onwards, OP Jindal Global University has been given the distinguished privilege to host the memorial lecture in fond remembrance of Dr. L.M. Singhvi, thanks to Dr. Abhishek Manu Singhvi for the generous philanthropic act of instituting the Singhvi family endowment in OP Jindal Global University. I assure Dr. Singhvi and the Singhvi family that the trust you have entrusted upon us will be vindicated in its right signification. I thank you also for making JGU a part of the responsibility to carry Dr. Eldam Singhvi's legacy forward. I sense the serendipitous appropriateness in Dr. Singhvi's choice of JGU for establishing the Singhvi endowment and to take the legacy of Dr. Singhvi forward as JGU is also the result of a remarkable act of philanthropy by its benefactor and Chancellor Mr. Jindal, following the footsteps of John Harvard, Yale, Yale Leland Stan Jane Stanford, besides our own experiences of the contributions of Sri Madan Mohan Malviya in establishing the Banaras Hindu University. JGU has philanthropy, one of the strongest soul force responsible for the emergence and advancement of world-class modern universities ingrained in its foundations. Thanks to Mr. Jindal for his extraordinary insight and vision. Of every good thought and reason which might have prompted Dr. Singhvi to trust the JGU, it is the said element of serendipity, perhaps a play of admix cosmic forces that stands silly. It is also about gratitude and celebration of one's past and its connectedness to the present and the future where both Dr. Abhishek Singhvi and Chancellor Mr. Jindal have created institutions and initiatives to celebrate their life and legacy of their parents. The Singhvi endowment at JGU will have five major components to it. First, the Dr. Abhishek Manu Singhvi Outstanding Youth Scholarship. Two, Mrs. Anita Singhvi Outstanding Youth Scholarship. Three, Dr. Abhishek Manu Singhvi Academic Award and Gold Medal for Outstanding Academic Performance in Administrative Law. Four, Dr. L.M. Singhvi Annual Global Conference on International Law and International Relations. And five, Dr. L.M. Singhvi Memorial Annual Lecture Series, which we are doing today. Dr. Singhvi has undertaken countless philanthropic initiatives as a renowned public figure. One of the causes close to his heart is the transformation of legal and higher education in India. He established a Singhvi Trinity Scholarship at the Trinity College, University of Cambridge to provide international exposure and world-class education to Indian law students. As a vocal and committed member of the parliament, education and health issues have been his prime focus. He has given financial assistance to construct schools, laboratories, libraries, classrooms, community and common halls, promoting computer literacy. He's also established a Dr. L.M. Singhvi Manav Seva Kendra, a charitable trust in Jodhpur to provide quality health care. This is all apart from in addition to over 400 MP lad projects in the less developed districts of Western Rajasthan, which are encapsulated in a booklet released by the former Vice President of India, Sri Venkaya Naidu, who referred to as, and I quote, an exemplary and model use of MP lad funds for public good, unquote. Dr. L.M. Singhvi was a jurist with a vision a parliamentarian with a cause, a diplomat with an art, an author with an articulateness, a man of, and I quote Justice Krishnayar who said, a man of felicitous phrases and flowing sentences, unquote. A humanist with a benevolence. Dr. Singhvi's thoughts and acts have touched many walks of society, public administration, diplomacy, environment and sustainability, global peace, language and literature, education, healthcare, religion, and so on. On these, he thought artfully and acted tactfully, leaving indelible impressions of profound leadership. Dr. L.M. Singhvi believed in ideas, but not as airy nothings, rather as potential realities. He believed in the ideational possibilities of the Constitution of India to help us make new realities a better world. As he puts it, and I quote, a constitution is not only what it says, but is also what it does not do, unquote. Hence, Dr. L.M. Singhvi considered the constitution as a clarion call for willing and acting in the collective self-consciousness of the nation. I further quote that Dr. L.M. Singhvi from his sixth CD Deshmukh Memorial Lecture delivered on 14th January 1989, and I quote, My purpose is not to despair or to disparage. 
I do not believe in making a fetish of failures. In my view, the pathology of wallowing in the misery of self-denunciation contributes little to sound diagnosis and even less to nation building. On the other hand, an enlightened awareness of infirmities, a conscious acknowledgement of shortcomings, and a balanced and realistic appraisal of achievements and setbacks may prove to be conducive in the constructive fulfillment of the task which we, the people of India, have entrusted to ourselves when we attained our freedom, constituted ourselves into a a sovereign democratic republic and gave into ourselves the constitution." Unquote. Dr. L.M. Singh, we believed in the constitution's demand to make it the complete collective egalitarian dream it is. He believed in the individual and collective responsibility of each citizen to live thereby and to actualize this dream, what Dr. L.M. Singh refers to as progressive realization. Of the few unfinished tasks which the Constitution of India has left for Indians to be performed is the growth and development of citizenship values and the values of national unity and solidarity. It is through the means and methods and through the systems and processes of the Constitution that the simple social existence of being individuals in the society can be elevated into the higher consciousness of being the citizens of a state. It is the faith of Dr. L.M. Singhvi that is the theme of today's memorial lecture, Universal Adult Franchise. It is its manifestation as a means, a method, a system, a process that makes political transformation into a social transformation. When the rest of the world was caught up in a historical lag which had them hesitating at portals of change, limiting adult suffrage to select classes of population, India became a harbinger of change by extending adult suffrage to every adult irrespective of their class, caste, colour, creed and gender. The inclusivity of adult suffrage, which is the bedrock of every democracy, was achieved by many modern democracies only very late. In the United States, which is one of the oldest democracies in the world, it was on in the 1960s with the enactment of the Civil Rights Act of 1964 and the Voting Rights Act of 1965 that all African Americans across the United States received voting rights. In Switzerland, women obtained the right to vote as late as 1971, yet it was only recently, in 1990, that they gained full voting rights. While that was the case in the Western world, India achieved universal adult suffrage in 1950 alongside the birth of the Young Republic. Thanks to the extraordinary vision and resolve of Dr. B. R. Ambedkar, the founding father of the Indian democracy, it's quite extraordinary that we're holding this function at this auditorium. Dr. Ambedkar had the staunch faith that social democracy based on the principles of equality, liberty, and fraternity shall be at the base of political democracy. Absent social equality, he was aware that adult franchise would be a sham, a pretense of progressivism. Broadly, universal adult franchise is the state's promise to its masters that the people, that they will be taken seriously and their commands will be obliged to. Dr. L.M. Singhvi would be the happiest to see this once unfulfilled dream which the Constitution has taught us to dream becoming a reality today. All your presence today gives me a great sense of inspiration. It reminds me of the traditional African philosophy that provides us an understanding of ourselves in relation to the world. According to Ubuntu, I quote, there exists a common bond between all of us and it is through this bond, through our interaction with our fellow human beings that we discover our own human qualities. That a person is a person through other persons. We affirm our humanity only when we acknowledge that of others. I welcome all of you to this momentous occasion, to the celebration of the legacy of a versatile talent to this distinguished memory lecture. Dr. L. M. Singhvi lives in our hearts, in our thoughts, and in our lives as an inspiration and as an influence. Thank you. Thank you, Professor. I invite Dr. Abhishek Manu Singhvi, Member of Parliament and Senior Advocate of the Supreme Court of India, to welcome the Chief Guest and the Guest of Honour. Honorable Vice President of India, Honorable Chief Justice of India, Raj, distinguished members of this most august audience, Honorable Judges of the Supreme Court, Honorable Union Cabinet Ministers, Honorable Chief Minister Delhi, Honorable former Chief Justice of India, Honorable Attorney General, Honorable Judges of the High Court of Delhi, 
honorable former judges of the Supreme Court and former judges of the High Court, chairman of tribunals, honorable members of parliament, my colleagues, distinguished ladies and gentlemen, forgive me for not taking names. Our chief guest and guest of honor, special guest of honor today need no introduction. At a personal level, one brings the fragrance of Rajasthan, my home state, and the other pleasant memories of more youthful days. Though that is with great respect a disservice to the 50th Chief Justice of India, who continues to look youthful even now, and is probably the youngest looking incumbent of that office in 75 years. The man in whose memory we hold this memorial lecture was truly a remarkable man, the possessor of many multifaceted talents, but above all, an ideas man, a man of ideas. I recall how, while I was standing near him as a teenager, he simply put pen to paper and drafted the Law Day Charter within a few days, uh, within a few minutes, over four decades ago. He told the Supreme Court Bar Association over which he presided four times, that it was a major omission for India not to recognize the day the Indian constitution was completed. And thus was born by the Honorable Prime Minister who re-Christianed it officially as Constitution Day. When he told Prime Minister Vajpayee that the ancient philosophical, Indian philosophical concept of Setu Bandhanam, the social, cultural, and emotional bridge that connects India with Indians globally, Vajpayee insisted on appointing him as a cabinet rank chair of the Pravasi Bharati project. Thus was born the innovative report which led to the entire Pravasi Bharati movement, including its celebration as Pravasi Bharati Divas, when India's most famous NRI, Gandhiji, returned to India on 9th January. As a 30-year-old parliamentarian, fresh from Cornell, Harvard, Berkeley, and after a recent study visit to Sweden in the early 60s, when Dr. L.M. Singhvi incessantly talked about the Ombudsman movement, Nehru quizzically asked him, you give speeches all the time on Ombudsman, young man, to which zoo does this animal belong? You must indigenize it. Since L.M. Singhvi was, could converse in Sanskrit, he instantly coined the phrase Lokpal and Lokayukt, which passed into the Indian legal and parliamentary lexicon. In an ironical twist of fate, I chaired the Parliamentary Standing Committee on Law, which operationalized the Lokpal statute in 2011 and 12, exactly 40 years after he had first introduced the concept in Parliament. Through five Indian Prime Ministers and three British ones, he was India's longest serving Indian High Commissioner to UK after Krishna Menon. More recently, about a couple of years ago, just before COVID, I was struck by the scope and depth of the philosophical, cultural, literary, political, and social issues which he and then Prince and now King Charles exchanged in handwritten letters by both over that period when he was High Commissioner. When I collected and presented them to Prince Charles a few years ago, he recounted many other facets of that warm association. As United Nations Special Rapporteur on Independence of Judges, Lawyers, Jurors and Assessors, his seminal report was applauded and unanimously adopted as the Singhvi Principles on Judicial Independence at Quebec over 45 years ago and it is still in the corpus of UN literature referred to as the Singhvi principles. Rajiv Gandhi appointed him as chairman of the Panchayati Raj Revitalization Committee in the 1980s after telling him, quote, though Dr. Singhvi, you talk and write, write about our ancient Panchayati Raj institutions, they are in wreck and ruin everywhere, unquote. It was this report by him a few years later that led to the 73rd and the 74th constitutional amendments which have entrenched decentralized governance in the Indian constitutional scheme. He could speak, write, and orate extempore in three languages, Sanskrit, Hindi, and English. 
and has published prose and poetry in the last two. The list of his versatility is truly bewildering. Vice President Dhankar has traversed a long journey in a relatively short time, accumulating top-notch political, legal, and constitutional accolades on the way, but remains our very own, an intrinsic element of the legal biradari. He has been a live wire in whatever he has done. Bold, energetic, forthright, in-depth, and extremely hardworking. His warmth is legendary and his repartee most absorbing. His rootedness and earthiness, partly if I may say so attributable to the community he comes from, means that he needs no reality check, but instead keeps giving reality checks to those around him. Adornment of high office has not ended or eroded his spontaneity. When I went for a formal invite to this function, he spent, he spent five times the scheduled time regaling me with reminiscences of my father, of Rajasthan, of him and me at the bar, with gems of anecdotes. He now presides over the house where I am in now in my 16th year, and his legal acumen and diplomatic skills, as he knows well, will not only stand him in good stead, but will also be tested to the limits. The best I can say about him is that the best is yet to come. Chief Justice Chandrachud's very exalted office prevents, prevents me, sadly, from sharing several personal anecdotes. But after a relatively disappointing academic result, disappointed in inverted commas, in his school leaving examination, actually a very honorable result, but disappointing by his exacting standards, he did what might be described best as revenge academia. He went on to top Delhi University and did not stop till LLM and SJD Harvard. Rarely have such scholastic achievements adorned the bench, but they are coupled with a softness and humility which is enchanting. As is said, a good diplomat is one who tells you to go to hell in a manner that you start looking forward to the journey. The CGI is a paradoxical combination of softness and firmness personified. Even before attaining the top judicial position in this country, he has created a legacy of progressive, liberal, inclusive, and pluralistic values through his seminal judgments. Many more are yet to flow from his erudite pen. Clearly, he has a vision, a forward-looking approach, and a reformist's zeal. The topic for today itself reflects it, the hiatus between electoral rights and autonomy versus its transfo transformation into social and economic good. I have no doubt that the Honorable Chief Justice of India will leave his indelible stamp on the vital judicial organ of state and through that on India as a whole. Friends, I cannot thank you all enough for gracing us with your august presence in such large numbers. And each one of the categories, which I mentioned in the beginning, without taking names, is present here. Resuming this memorial series, in which the last pre-COVID -pre lecture was delivered by former Supreme Court Judge Justice Rohinton Nariman on reincarnation, gives us an opportunity to consecrate the memory of a great son of India, and to listen to the wise words of our chief guest, and most distinguished memorial lecturer. Thank you very much indeed. Thank you, Dr. Singhvi. With great honor, I invite Honorable Justice Dr. D.Y. Chandrachud, Chief Justice of India, to deliver the eighth Dr. L.M. Singhvi Memorial Lecture on the theme, Universal Adult Franchise, Translating India's Political Transformation into a Social Transformation. The Honorable Vice President of India, Sri Jagdeep Dhankar. This galaxy of distinguished public personalities, not just within the judiciary, former Chief Justices, judges, but sitting judges and beyond. I was looking at the signboards with so much of trepidation. 
public life, MPs, ministers, judges, judges, reserve, judges, judges. I launch upon this endeavor with a degree of fear in my heart, the same sort that I had when I first presented my argument for uh, consideration before a single judge of the High Court. Uh, Professor Rajkumar, Dr. Abhishek Singhvi, uh, Mr. Avishkar Singhvi, other family members of Dr. L.M. Singhvi and the distinguished invitees who are part of this evening's event. Good evening. I'm happy to have this opportunity to honor the memory of one of the tallest doyans of the Indian Bar, Dr. L.M. Singhvi. I have many fond memories of my childhood in the home of Dr. Singhvi and his very gracious spouse. And I have looked up to him as I began my career in the law. One of my early cases as a lawyer was when we were briefed to appear on behalf of Renu Sagar in an arbitration matter which came up before Chief Justice Chittadosh Mukherjee and Justice Sujata Manohar in the Bombay High Court. We had a difficult case, almost a bad one. But Dr. Singhvi really, with his profound learning and wisdom, embellished it, not just with the law, but with literature and with life, and brought, brought us, at least in our own view, on the threshold of victory, which was eventually denied to us. An astute jurist, a fierce parliamentarian and a prolific writer, Dr. L.M. Singhvi was an encyclopedia of knowledge on Indian history and culture. Dr. Singhvi, Dr. L.M. Singhvi played an important role in shaping Indian public life through his career as a lawyer, as well as a distinguished parliamentarian. One of the most significant causes that Dr. L.M. Singhvi championed was the Panchayati Raj institution with a focus on the importance of self-government. To honor Dr. L.M. Singhvi's commitment to the role played by citizens and their engagement with electoral democracy, I'm speaking today on the topic Universal Adult Franchise, translating India's political transformation into a social transformation. First, I will talk about the historical context in which we must reflect on the idea of Universal Adult Franchise. Second, I will discuss how this idea was deliberated and included in the constitutional discourse leading to the drafting of India's constitution. Third, I will reflect on the impact of universal adult franchise post-independence and how it has created social transformation. Fourth, I shall be talking about how the idea of Panchayati Raj, along with universal adult franchise, led to the deepening of India's democracy. Fifth, I will be reflecting on the connections between universal adult franchise and the idea of participatory democracy. And lastly, I shall be reflecting on the Indian experiment with universal adult franchise. This is an ambitious project which presumes that the audience will not reflect a sense of boredom. First, let me dwell briefly on the historical context to understand universal adult franchise. The context is not just of India, but across the globe. History tells us that power was concentrated in the hands of a few. In many countries, power was used as a medium to control the behavior of people. Even when the idea of democracy emerged, the exercise of power was made limited only to the already powerful, whom we know as the so-called noble class. Democracy then was a means or an instrument to entrenchment. For instance, when the wave of democracy emerged in the world's oldest democracy, the United States of America, the structures of democracy which were set up excluded the marginalized and the oppressed communities. African Americans were not even considered citizens of America when the US Constitution was adopted. In India, we find a historical social system in which power was concentrated in the hands of the upper class of society. The rights which we now consider as universal were not universal all the time. They were denied 
to the oppressed. This was the norm across the world. Those who did not hold power were subjected to several levels of oppression. Against this power hegemony, several social reformers led movements towards the distribution of power. These movements were to democratize the hold over power by a few communities. When the structure of democracy was adopted by several countries in the 18th and 19th centuries, unfortunately, the exercise of democracy was used to retain power by the few. The right to vote was controlled and exercised by only those individuals who had already succeeded in society because of their social power and cultural capital. For instance, the right to vote was exercised only by those who had certain properties or educational institutions or qualifications, which were the result of not their individual effort, but were a reflection of the influence and hegemony their communities had on society. As a result, the idea of democracy itself was controlled by the elites of society. In that sense, the structure and exercise of democracy were only retrenchments of social privilege and hegemony. Voting rights were denied to women and members of the marginalized communities because the elite did not want to share the power with them and neither considered them to be capable of exercising a wise exercise of citizenship. It is in this history of injustice and exclusion that we must look at the idea of universal adult franchise. The demand for equal voting rights and to become a part of the political process emerged from the marginalized communities across the world. Instances of this challenge can be found in the women's suffrage movement globally and the movement of the socially oppressed. The emergence of social movements to gain voting rights was a simultaneous phenomenon which was taking place across the world. People from different countries found inspiration and learned from each other how to claim an equal say in decision making. If we take the example of the United States, we see that the black community led the struggle to claim their humanity by asking for basic rights such as the right to vote. When the 13th, 14th and 15th amendments to the American Constitution were adopted because of the struggle of the American black community, we also found a resonance happening in India. It inspired our social leaders coming from the marginalized communities. These social reformers not only demanded equal citizenship for the oppressed, but also started initiatives that could educate the masses about their rights. For instance, Prominent social reformers like Jyotiba Phule and Savitri Bai Phule started schools for girls to make them aware of the happenings in the world and also about their rights. In his book titled Gulamgiri, translated as slavery, Jyotiba Phule appealed to the upper caste Indians that they should make way for the marginalized in the same way the Americans did by abolishing slavery through the 13th Amendment of the US Constitution. In that way, the negotiations against colonial power of the British government were not by a uniform stream of thought. While a few Indians demanded a share in the administration, leaders such as Jyotiba Phule were laying down the groundwork for an alternate picture of providing the chance to become part of the administration to everyone. When the negotiations to give rights to Indians and to draft their constitution were happening in the 20th century, our leaders such as Dr. Baba Saheb Ambedkar led a strong demand that the conception of a free India cannot happen without giving universal adult franchise. According to Dr. Ambedkar, the idea of universal adult franchise was non-negotiable. In his submissions before the South Borough Community, the Committee of 1919, which was constituted the draft, the Government of India Act 1919, Dr. Ambedkar categorically asserted that the right to become a part of the political system was interlinked with the idea of citizenship itself. It was his belief that without exercising the right to vote, no one could claim to be a citizen. Baba Saheb Ambedkar believed that adult suffrage would create political conscience among the oppressed castes. Therefore, in that sense, 
the struggle for social change, which happened for several years from the 1920s till independence, aimed at the distribution of power by claiming equal voting rights. The marginalized communities had to struggle every inch to claim equal rights. Therefore, the idea of universal adult franchise is not just a political idea. The idea of universality in adult franchise is a social idea and vision at its core. Our history tells us that society was regulated by denying power to certain communities. And therefore, the emergence of universal adult franchise as a demand aimed at undoing centuries of oppression. Furthermore, the idea of a universal adult franchise was also reflected in the political demand for freedom through documents such as the Nehru Committee Report of 1928, the Karachi Resolution of 1931, only to name a few. This evolution was also seen in the debates and discussions of the Constituent Assembly, which is the next segment. Under colonial rule, Indians were still confronted with a limited franchise and limited participation in government. The Government of India Act of 1919 and the Government of India Act of 1935 reflected limited franchise qualified by property, income, and education. Under the 1919 Act, women were categorically disqualified from voting. The 1935 Act, despite providing a broader franchise, could cover only one-fifth of the total population. So when Dr. Ambedkar introduced the principle of universal adult suffrage in the Constituent Assembly on 16 June 1949, there were certainly apprehensions among the members of the Assembly. Certain members opposed it on the ground that adult suffrage presupposes that the electorate is enlightened and believed that in a country with high levels of illiteracy and in a largely poverty-stricken republic, the experiment of universal adult suffrage would not be successful. Some even called it the greatest risk which the Constituent Assembly has taken. At the same time, there were members who considered adult suffrage to be a natural choice to Indians, India's freedom movement. After detailed deliberation, the Constituent Assembly decided to adopt adult franchise universally and affirm political equality, marking the transformative character of our Constitution. The nation was shedding its colonial and pre-colonial shackles and evolving to adopt the system of parliamentary democracy based on equality of citizenship and universal adult franchise. The preamble of the Constitution, beginning with the words, we the people, made it abundantly clear that the will of people of India was a source of sovereign authority and that India was to be constituted as a sovereign, secular, democratic republic. Universal adult franchise was set to bring a five-fold increase in the electorate, extending it from three and a half crores of voters to 17 crores of voters who were to participate in the first parliamentary elections of independent India. As Allah the Krishnaswami Iyer observed, in spite of the ignorance and illiteracy of the large mass of the Indian people, the Assembly has adopted the principle of adult franchise with an abundant faith in the common man and the ultimate success of democratic rule, and in the full belief that the introduction of democratic government on the basis of adult suffrage will bring enlightenment and promote the well-being, the standard of life, the comfort, and the decent living of common citizens. The introduction of universal adult franchise was truly a revolutionary act at a time when such a right had only recently been extended to women people of color and the working class in supposedly mature Western democracies. In this sense, our constitution was a feminist document as well as an egalitarian, socially transformative document. It was a break from the colonial and pre-colonial legacy, the boldest move adopted by the constitution that was truly a product of Indian imagination. The drafters of our constitution were cognizant that political equality will not suffice to weed out the inequality that existed in the social and economic spheres 
of Indian society. Even before the constitution came into force, Dr. Ambedkar remarked about the contrasting realities which gripped the country at the time of its inception, where people, as he said, would enter a life of contradictions, having equality in political life, but inequality in socio-economic life. He said, and I quote him, on the 26th of January, 1950, we are going to enter into a life of contradictions. In politics, we will have equality, and in social and economic life, we will have inequality. In politics, we will be recognizing the principle of one man, one vote, one value. In our social and economic life, we shall, by reason of our social and economic structure, continue to deny the principle of one man, one value. In view of these observations, the principle of one person, one vote was adopted in the hope that political equality will gradually help overcome and diminish the deep, the deep and abiding structural inequalities which plagued India. Universal adult franchise, enshrined in Article 326 of our Constitution, was committed to transforming a fractured society into a democratic, participatory and egalitarian society, translating India's political equality into social transformation, guided by the values of human dignity, liberty, equality, fraternity, and social justice. Now let's come closer home over the last 70 years, the post-independence experiments and experiences. As we see, universal adult franchise was a solid determination of India's founding leaders to create a democratic state. However, the translation of the right to vote being bestowed upon citizens and its realization has not been a simple journey. The Constituent Assembly Secretariat started the preparation of electoral rolls in 1947 itself. It began issuing press releases which allowed it to communicate with the public. In response to concerns, the precise method and procedure of creating the electoral rolls was published in the press. The constitutional advisor, B. N. Rao, himself oversaw these press releases. The press releases informed the public of the stories of what happens next and any recurring alterations to the procedure. A distinguished scholar, Ornish Shani, while describing the work of the Constituent Assembly Secretariat, writes, in the same way an intimate address in a novel allows people to conjure up a uniquely vivid experience. The Constituent Assembly Secretariat's correspondence enabled people to conjure up a world of universal adult franchise. The preparation of the first electoral roll was also a momentous task as the majority of the population, 86%, was illiterate and the new Republic of India was grappling with the horrors of partition, war and famine. While preparing the first electoral rolls, many women's names were missing and instead there was a description of the voter as ex's mother or wise wife. Young girls married off at an early age and forced to shift to a different matrimonial village, found it extremely difficult to get their names enrolled in the electoral constituency of their spouse's village. The election commission had to rectify this and redo the exercise again. It also took time to notify the reserved constituencies for scheduled castes and scheduled tribes, as relevant data was not available immediately. Furthermore, to increase its reach to the widest section of the population, the newly created Election Commission of India at the time innovated with outreach campaigns. It ran a documentary on franchise and duties of the electorate in over 3,000 cinema halls to encourage citizens. This was done to educate the masses about the election process. The Election Commission thus achieved the feat of preparing the first electoral rolls for 176 million Indians aged 21 years and more for deciding the fate of 4,500 seats, including 500 for Parliament and 4,000 for the State Assemblies. Right from the first elections of independent India, Indian citizens have demonstrated enthusiasm in participating in the electoral processes. Several constitutional commentators have believed 
that India will not be able to survive as a constitutional democracy, but our citizens have proved them to be wrong. Universal adult franchise helped establish a sense of belonging and responsibility among citizens as equal stakeholders in the country's progress. This sense of belonging and faith in democracy is best captured by the life of late Sri Sham Sarang Negi, the first voter of independent India in 1951, who recently passed away on 5th November 2022, just three days after voting for the 34th time in the Uttarakhand State Assembly elections. He had along the way encouraged everyone to cast their votes and choose candidates after mindful deliberation. It has to be ensured that everyone is able to participate in elections. For instance, the Election Commission has on multiple occasions set up polling booths for a single voter. During the 2004 general elections, the Commission set up a polling booth for just this one voter. In the same vein, the plight of migrant workers must be considered, who most often are unable to effectively cast their vote in their constituency. Most migrant voters leave their hometowns and have to migrate to different cities in search of livelihood, to different states and different corners of the country in search of livelihood for themselves and their families. One aspect which we must emphasize is the participation in the electoral process by those communities who initially did not have the right to vote but were granted the right by the Constitution. Post-independence history tells us that the marginalized communities such as the Dalits have considered the right to vote and the idea of universal adult franchise as a sacrosanct feature of the Indian Constitution. These communities have shown a kind of ownership of the Constitution because they believed that it was the Constitution which gave them equal rights as well as the power to exercise and claim those rights. Therefore, we must not look at the particular history of post-independence India from solely a political lens. But we must understand that it is an interlinked phenomenon with the social emergence of democratic ideas. We see that the raising of political demands by the marginalized accompanied their demand to have equal rights and constitutional safeguards. Universal adult franchise, in that sense, acted as an equalizing force in shaping the future of India. Those who were denied the rights and powers now became a force, a deciding force, in selecting the composition of parliament. This is an example of how political transformation through universal adult franchise led to social transformation in Indian society. Universal adult franchise provided confidence to the oppressed communities whose right to even believe in themselves was taken away by oppressive structures and groups. Let me dwell now on the Panchayati Raj. Several years after independence, it was felt that there must be a decentralization of the constitutional structure. The idea was to deepen democracy and to make it further deliberative. Several individuals from the people's movement, as well as the leading lawmakers and jurists, including Dr. L.M. Singhvi, played a significant role in taking the idea of decentralization forward. Dr. Singhvi chaired the Committee for Revitalization of Panchayati Raj Institutions for Democracy and Development, popularly known as the L.M. Singhvi Committee. The committee submitted its report in 1986 and identified Gram Sabhas as the incarnation of direct democracy and put forward the proposal of constitutional recognition of, of local self-governing institutions. The report also focused on the importance of conducting panchayat elections without delay, the provision of adequate financial resources to panchayat raj institutions, and the establishment of panchayati raj judicial tribunals, amongst others. The most significant achievement of the L.M. Singhvi Committee was that it led to the constitutional recognition of panchayati raj institutions in 1992 through the 73rd and 74th Constitutional Amendment Act 
leading to the insertion of Part 9 in the Constitution. These amendments gave a new dimension to the entire concept of democratic decentralization of power to the rural people of the country. These amendments had an effect on the conception of democracy itself, which is a basic feature of the Indian Constitution. The Supreme Court has held that the 73rd and 74th constitutional amendments enhanced the basic feature of the Constitution. In the case which is reported as the NCT of Delhi versus the Union of India in July 2018, our court has held that the structures of governance created through these amendments have constitutionally entrenched participatory and representative democracy. Furthermore, the existence of panchayats to tribal areas, the extension of panchayats to tribal areas through the Panchayat Extension to Scheduled Areas Act of 1996 is a constitutional recognition of the legacy and culture of self-governance that the indigenous communities have. It also tells us that the practice of democracy through universal adult franchise is not just limited to Delhi, but is happening in the remotest parts of India. How do we view universal adult franchise and participatory democracy? Universal adult franchise is not limited to exercising the right to vote once every five years. Rather, Citizens engage with political processes all the time and reflect their choice through their votes later. Thus, the concept of universal adult franchise is linked with the idea of participatory democracy. Our nine-judge bench decision of the Supreme Court in case Puttuswamy of 2017 has held, and I quote, it must be realized that it is the right to question, the right to scrutinize, and the right to dissent, which enables an informed citizenry to scrutinize the actions of government. Those who are governed are entitled to question those who govern about the discharge of their constitutional duties, including in the provision of socioeconomic welfare benefits. The power to scrutinize and to reason enables the citizens of a democratic polity to make informed decisions on basic issues which govern their rights. The exercise of the right to vote by citizens is an informed choice made by them. The actual realization of one's vote is to continuously participate in democracy in everyday life, to ask questions from the elected representatives, and to keep the state accountable. Consultation, dialogue, debate, and negotiation occur among diverse social groups, with participation not confined to elections, but extend to the larger political and public spheres to facilitate social transformations. The citizen's ability to participate in electoral democracy and promote good governance was also enhanced to the tool of the right to information. On a similar note, the Supreme Court of India recently inaugurated the online right to information portal which further eases and facilitates the process for citizens to file RTI applications and access information. What does the Indian experiment with universal adult franchise then tell us? The Indian experiment with universal adult franchise contradicts all myths against it. It was believed that only a few had the wisdom to vote or to vote wisely. Our experience tells us that even the most vulnerable have the political consciousness to choose their leader they want. Therefore, we must reject every form of elite understanding of the democratic process, which we keep hearing constantly, that only the educated are better decision makers. Individuals whom society has despised as being uneducated have shown tremendous political acumen and awareness of local problems which even the educated may not readily understand. The elite perception that only the educated or few individuals should have the right to vote shows contempt and distrust towards democracy. Since independence, there are lakhs of examples of how individuals have used the power they received in the form of their right to vote 
to exercise political power beyond merely electing their representatives as they formed pressure groups and movements exerting and influencing the elected representatives to further the rights of individuals and engineer a social transformation. This is truly reflective of the power of participatory democracy. Electoral democracy has been an agent of, per of pervasive change at the village and municipal levels. The reservation of seats for women and marginalized social groups in panchayats has given them the power to shape their own destinies. It is a silent revolution done by the universal adult franchise in India. There are numerous examples across India of exemplary work done by women sarpanches or all women panchayats in different parts of India. This also demonstrates the bottom top approach to governance. Lastly, Dr. Baba Sahib Ambedkar believed that universal adult suffrage would act as a stimulus that would help gradually transform India's political equality into social and economic equality. The Indian experience has shown us the transformative potential of universal adult franchise. I'm deeply grateful to the Dr. Singhvi family for inviting me for this lecture. <laughs> Namaskar. Thank you for your enlightening words, sir. We're deeply honored by the presence of our chief guest. May I invite with great reverence and privilege the Honorable Vice President of India, Sri Jagdeep Dhankar, to address this August gathering. Friends, it is turning out to be a difficult day. I am told, officially, Parliament session will begin on December 7. But I find Leader of the House, Pius Goelji here, Senior Member Parliament Rajya Sabha, on the dais, Chidambaramji being there, Kartika Sharma, Mr. Sahani, and we have Chief Minister of Delhi here. Normally, I would have given precedence to the judges a fraternity which I hold in high esteem, and I am part of it by being a member of the bar for long. I recognize the presence of distinguished judges, former Chief Justice, Justice Loda, and others. I'll be making a mistake, and therefore, I'm not taking names of all of them, but I hope. I don't miss out a single Rajya Sabha member. <laughs> that could be a little too risky. Dr. D.Y. Chandrachud, Honorable Chief Justice, Supreme Court of India. Sir, it was intellectual feast. You have traversed the issues so comprehensively, and in some sense, gave me some relief after Dr. Singhvi said, I have tough times ahead. Dr. Singhvi, a distinguished senior advocate, a very senior member of Rajya Sabha, and a family member of Dr. L.M. Singhvi family. Professor Dr. C. Rajkumar, Vice Chancellor O.P. Jindal Global University. I have known him recently. I have known of him much earlier. A man who knows how to create institutions spinally. Sri Aviskar Singhvi, I indicated to Dr. Abhishek Singhvi time for him to pass on the button to him. And mind you, in doing so, I might have taken some risk, he indicated, after December 7. 
But this should happen in seamless natural course. Family members of Dr. Singhvi are present here. They will bear me out. Some kind words have been used by Dr. Singhvi about me. I'm so glad my wife is not here. <laughs> and Chief Justice Loda knows she is irrepressible when it comes to truth. I therefore was very cautious during three years as Governor of the State of West Bengal that she does not attend a single assembly session. I never thought I will have this great occasion. There can't be a greater privilege to be associated in some manner with the name of Dr. Alam Singhvi, whom I had the occasion to know personally and benefit out of that relationship. I shared it with the Attorney General when we were together a while ago at Uprashtapati Nivas. And he was a little surprised that I knew the man so intimately for decades. Grateful to Singhvi Endowment and OP Jindal Global University for making me part of 8th LM Singhvi Memorial Lecture. The Chancellor Navin Jindal is also here. Grateful to you. I appreciate the well thought out theme of the Memorial Lecture, Universal Adult Franchise, translating India's political transformation into a social transformation. Since I have been part of governance for the last three years, in some measure, I might not be in a position to take down all that has been reflected so far. I have seen it in practical terms because we are the world's most vibrant democracy that is representative, I would say, to an ideal level. And I'm sure no one here will disagree with that thought process. We started with the Constituent Assembly. The members were enormously talented. They were drawn from all segments of society. But progressively with each election, our parliament reflects authentically the mandate of the people wisdom of the people. And now, what we have in Parliament is fairly representative. And I can indicate to you without fear of contradiction, at a global level, we do not have a parallel on that count. <laughs> to reflect initially about Padam Bhushan, Dr. Lakshmimal Singhvi, He was a very different kind of a man. But I have something in common with him. He was elected to the third Lok Sabha from Jodhpur, 1962 to 67. I was elected to the ninth Lok Sabha from Rajasthan, Junjunu. But where we slightly parted ways was that in 67 he became an ex MP. In 92, I became an ex MP because our term did not complete. <laughs> then Dr. Singhvi continued with his pursuit of serving the society at large, but got an occasion to be in parliament after 30 years. Just imagine, I have been his eclave. To follow in his footsteps, I waited for 30 years. and would land in Rajya Sabha, in parliament, after three decades. Dr. L.M. Singhvi, unlike the tribe of senior advocates, I am not one at the moment. I ceased to be one on 30th of July, 2019, 
when I took oath of the office of governor of West Bengal. So I parted company with a jealous mistress. Trust me, till that time, I pondered the jealous mistress to the best of my ability. I am yet to see a system where we have human beings enormously talented. They will project sublime concepts of transparency, accountability. But when it comes to dictating their own actions on a global horizon, they may constitute a people have to be honest to themselves, a most exploitative tribe. We are before the man, Chief Justice of India, who will take the institution to greater heights. And 1.4 billion people look up to him, including those who are in parliament. Sir, Monday and Friday, the spectacle is bewildering. And that is something we need to think about. During my brief tenure as vice president of the country, I have been abroad twice. And you cannot imagine the kind of respect India has. We are, as a nation, on the rise as never before. And our rise is unstoppable. No one in the world discounts it, except some of us. To give real meaning to the sublimity of our elected verdict, we all will have to rise to a level where partisan prism should not be there when the interest of the nation is at heart. I'll give you a few illustrations which I had the occasion to share with the world leaders. Can you find any other country in the world which has handled COVID the way we have done? 1.4 billion people, dose one, dose two, and booster. It will take beyond 2.5 billion. And all recorded digitally and made available. A situation that doesn't obtain in the West. We have done it. Reflect back, could there have been more man-made problems? Could there have been greater difficulties than that was generated? The kind of ecosystem that was sought to be evolved. We don't look back, we need to analyze. When it comes to tackling a pandemic, national interest must always prevail. As governor of the state of West Bengal, I know when pandemic, pandemic was there, there was a real issue to make available food to the needy. 800 million in this country, 800 million, many countries in the world are unable to digest this figure, were made available cereal, rice, pulse, from 1st April 2020, and it continues. And this doesn't end here. If we are talking of the subject at issue, social transform transformation brought about political transformation. Imagine the kind of inclusive growth we have had. I know, as a lawyer, I went to a bank to get a loan of rupees 6,000. Bank of Baroda. I wanted to create a library of my own. I was ever beholden to the manager who gave me 6,000 rupees loan without a security. And look at where we are. We have developed an ecosystem by affirmative governance steps that every individual is in a position to fully exploit his or her talent. And that is why 
the number of startups we have is unknown to the world as such. In the first half of 2022, the number of unicorns we have, and for more than a billion fiscal dimension, is unrivaled in the world. We are ahead of China. And therefore, Indian democracy will continue to be vibrant. But when it comes to the issues that directly concern India, we must rise to the occasion and keep only one thing in mind, interest of Bharat. The Honorable Chief Justice reflected, and it is indicated in the preamble of our Constitution, we the people. That means the power resides in the people. Their mandate, their wisdom. Imagine a situation where Indian Parliament reflected the mindset of the people. Indian Parliament in 2015-16 was dealing with a Constitutional Amendment Act and as a matter of record the entire Lok Sabha voted unanimously. There was no abstention in Lok Sabha. There was no dissension. And that amendment act was passed. In Rajya Sabha, it was unanimous. There was one abstention, no opposition. So we, the people, their ordainment was converted into a constitutional provision. The power of the people came to be reflected through most sanctified mechanism on a legitimate platform through applicable mechanism. That power was undone. The world does not know of any such instance I appeal to the people here, they constitute judicial elite class, thinking minds, intellectuals. Please find out a peril in the world where a constitutional provision can be undone. Our Indian constitution provides in explicit terms, Article 145.3, interpretation of the Constitution when a substantive question of law is involved can be undertaken by the court. Nowhere it says a provision can be run down. Look at it from another perspective. If a constitutional provision that carries the ordainment of the people at large in such a vibrant democracy is undone, what will happen? I'm appealing to everyone that these are the issues that must not be viewed on partisan lines. I expect everyone to rise to the occasion and to be part of the growth story that is India at the moment. We have a platform where all issues can be debated, traversed, but what I'm started and senior members are present here. After this verdict, there was no whisper in the parliament. It was taken as such. This is too serious an issue. We are proud of our judiciary. It has contributed hugely to the growth of promoting the rights of the people. Innovative mechanism was taken recourse to in the 80s, where a postcard could galvanize a judicial action. But I pose a question to myself. After 9-11, US had the Patriot Act. That Patriot Act was passed, both by the Congress and Senate, but not with this majority. There was a position in the Congress, there was a position in the Senate. 
Senate was by and large unanimous, but there were two senators who opposed. And it went through. Examine the provisions of Patriot Act. And I appeal to every legal mind. And you'll find how discriminatory it is. But it emanated from a source that was taken as not beyond reach of any other authority. And that is why primacy of national interest prevails. I am not trying to say something which is not known to us. But time has come when we are talking what is the impact of political transformation on social transformation. Honorable, the Chief Justice was reflecting part nine of the Constitution. A new part was there. We had Panchayati Razri from 1952. But to give it a constitutional status, to make it a government of a local nature, a structure was given on the level of parliament and legislature. A separate state finance commission was given that would engage into devolution of funds between state and panchayats. On the same pattern as the National Finance Commission that does between the union and the states. Similar situation was created by way of part nine capital A for municipalities. Imagine if these were to be undone. What will happen? Most recently, we have had this kind of governance with the co cooperative sector, part nine capital B. Now, friends, I put it to you. The basic of the basic structure is primacy of the will of the people. In democracy or in any governance, there can be nothing more basic than prevalence of the rights of the people. And that prevalence has to be adjusted on fundamental parameters, that is, the ordainment of the people must be reflected through legitimized mechanism, which is through legislature, in a sanctified manner, which means it must be debated, discussed, and passed. If that takes a shape, and then we have this kind of scenario. I'm sure it is never too late to reflect and think. Our judiciary, being one of the critical institutions of governance, along with executive and legislature, the doctrine of separation of powers is fundamental to our governance. The harmonious working, working in tandem and togetherness of these institutions is vital for growth of democracy. Any incursion, however subtle, in the domain of the other by one, has the capacity and potential to unsettle the apple cart of governance. I therefore avail the opportunity, in the name of Dr. Alam Singhbi, who always believed and propounded rule of law should be a guiding factor in all our actions. Sometimes it takes something different to speak out a mind. I have high regard for Dr. Singhvi. But imagine he feels I'll have a tough time on 7th December and onwards. This perception itself is a very, very dangerous perception. We will have to have an open mind. We must believe in sublimity and efficacy of our institutions. I have engaged in extensive discussion with all the members of parliament. Some of them who are present here could not make it. I will have outies to them. I know they are very distinguished, talented, enormously talented. But it is only interaction that alone can define 
our way forward stands. I have chosen to deviate from the script for the reason that some reflections have come to be made. Look around the world during COVID, robust health infrastructure of Manhattan collapsed. We had the spectacle of people dying in corridors of London hospitals. The powerful economies of the world, be it Germany, France, or Italy, the first two being very powerful economically, had no answer to it. We battled. We battled with innovation. We battled with synergizing various agencies. We came out of it. But during that time, there was intervention. Intervention at all levels. That intervention was not there in any other theater of the world. When the scenario in the West was much worse, and they claimed to the entire world, we have robust health, health infrastructure. People were paying for it. It collapsed. I therefore beseech that every institution has a role in making what we in India are today. Every institution has a well-defined role. Legislature has a defined role, so is the executive, so is the legislature. And all are subject to the ultimate ordinament of the people. And there is only one mechanism for that, the parliament. I'm venturing out, I know, in a terrain which may call for immediate reaction. Because we are in tough times. For drop of a hat, the other point of view is indigestible. I have worked in my earlier office 100% in constitutional groove. I am under oath. Under no circumstances, I will do otherwise. But all of us have to keep in mind that if lack of courage and conviction and they contribute to failure of duty or dilution of duty, then we are not serving the nation as expected by the Constitution. Why I am saying so? I have noticed, and after extensive interaction, helplessness of the honorable members. They are enormously talented. <clears throat> they have discussed with me, deliberated with me, and they say, we can't assure you. On the floor of the house, we'll have to dictate our actions as directed, as indicated. Now, if that is to happen at the cost of the nation, then where we are? I wouldn't take more time. I would only say that we are a country on the rise. Our social parameters are ascending like a plateau. <clears throat> when I was a member of parliament in 1989, a power in my hand was 50 gas connections. And that was a power I used to flaunt. Imagine 90 million or 100 million or 180 million, as the people may like to call, those connections were given free to needy households. Any government that has to deliver as per aspiration of the people is bound to do it. Therefore, to introduce politics, when it comes to constitutional offices, is unfortunate. I would come towards the end, 
by sharing my great pain. We are a different country. Till I ceased to be a senior advocate on 30th of July 2019 when I took my oath and parted company. I had to suffer situations. People were just not cognizant that I became a senior within 11 years of my practice. I was trying to find bearings and place in indigestible system. Lived through the corridors. And mind you, with a background in academics of which I can be ever proud. Why I say so? We generate economic status by hard work. But we generate iconic status in our country on baffling parameters. Our parameters will surprise us. And those parameters often are activated by event management. Time has come when the true talent of this country and ethos of this country need to be recognized. I can assure you the tide is unstoppable. It shall happen. We have a parliament which is far more representative at the moment. And we have seen the changing profile of industry and economics. And those who have made entry into economics, industry and commerce, on the strength of their idea and innovation, are marching ahead of those established leaders in economy. And that is why today we can take pride that there is hardly a global entity of repute that does not have presence of Indian human genius. Friends, <clears throat> I am leaving you with one thought. What I have traversed was in a compulsive situation. I am sure you will bestow your earnest, objective, considered attention to this, and as true citizens of this country, generate a public opinion that political stance should be distanced from sublimity of our constitutional functioning. It is never too late to make a different way of life available to us. The basic structure doctrine, we have lived with it. You have taken it as such. It was by a majority of seven is to six. It was given to us in a more form. It came to be developed from time to time. Its indicators were given. But as a student of law, as a modest student of law, can parliamentary sovereignty be ever compromised? Can a succeeding parliament be bound by what has been done by earlier parliament? And that, I'm sure, is a thought you all will best attention to. I'm grateful to the opportunity that has been made available to me by these two significant outfits. And I'm sure I would not have ventured to express my thoughts, but for the great respect I have for Dr. Alam Singhvi. I conclude by saying, as a lawyer unknown to Dr. Singhvi, I was grappling with an incident that happened in Rajasthan, which became subject matter of litigation. And that was in the making of a film, Deceivers. As you all are aware, under the Cinematograph Act, if certification is given, that affords you immunity from prosecution as regards contents of that film. What happens if an action is challenged before certification, during the making of the movie. So I was stuck up in court. And that was the situation after Supreme Court had taken a view 
In the case of Satyam Siyam Sundaram, the certification affords you, that was on a review, a case had come from Indore, another from Delhi. In one case, they said no. But in the second case, the same bench said yes, immunity is afforded from criminal prosecution because you are possessed of a certification from the cinematograph board. I came to Dr. Singhvi. I thought he was the only one who can throw some light. I met him. The client was persuading Dr. Singhvi to appear himself. As a matter of fact, Dr. Singhvi had undertaken to the client and the client was known to Dr. Singhvi for a long time. After hearing me, Dr. Singhvi made me write my submissions, but said he will not appear. I thereafter had the occasion to be in court, where he was assisting the court on one side, I was assisting the other side. Since that man could be so indulgent to a man from the village, and that is why Atal Bihari Vajpayee, a prime minister of this country known to all in the world, called him Saraswati Putra. Lakshmi Mal Singhvi had all the indulgence of Lakshmi. He was called Saraswati Putra. Current prime minister has called me Kisan Putra. So as Kisan Putra, I pick up the courage to appeal to all of you in the name of the people of this country that it is high time we scratch our brains, use all our institutions so that they work in synergy, in harmony, in tandem, in togetherness to serve the people of this great country that is on way to rise and the rise is unstoppable. Thank you so much. Thank you for your insightful words, sir. I request Professor Dr. Raj Kumar and Dr. Abhishek Manu Singhvi to present the chief guest and the guest of honor with a memento. I invite Mr. Avishkar Singhvi, leading advocate, to deliver the vote of thanks. Honorable Vice President of India, Honorable Chief Justice of India, Dr. Abhishek Singhvi, Professor C. Rajkumar, Honorable Judges of the Delhi High Court, Honorable Cabinet Ministers, and the Honorable Chief Minister of Delhi, and members of this esteemed audience, colleagues and friends. It is indeed a privilege for me to profess my pr profound gratitude to the dignitaries on the dais and the members of this delightful gathering. The Honorable Vice President of India and the Honorable Chief Justice of India endure unimaginably busy schedules, and we are grateful that they managed to grace us today. We are truly beholden to them for making time for this auspicious event in honor of Dr. Late L.M. Singhvi. The Honorable Vice President of India has regaled us with his rich experiences in many walks of life and memories of his association with LMS, as he was fondly remembered. Those were perhaps anecdotes of a different era, where such warm personal relationships prospered and blossomed, irrespective of political color, position, pelf, or power. One needs to perhaps hearken back to those times of less rancor, less distrust, and greater magnanimity, and, and more dialogue. 
That is what allowed traditions to grow, conventions to solidify, and legacies to be established. The guest of honor has been an astute leader, an eminent jurist, and statesman par excellence. To put it modestly, he's a fine concoction of experience, intellect, and wisdom. The Honorable Chief Justice of India has given us a scintillating and transformative lecture of seminal importance. The invaluable words of wisdom shall certainly drive the vehicle of political and social transformation. It is clear, if I may say with respect, that one of his possible lost vocations was that of a distinguished academic lead scholar. Today, inspiring lecture will help steer the nation to bridge the hiatus between promise and performance, between precept and actualization, between invention and implementation, between ideation and transformation. His work is of empirical significance, and it, as it bears true faith only to constitutional values, both in letter and spirit. The younger, younger members of the bar are enchanted by his liberal and progressive thought process and strongly support him in developing a constitutional ethos that propels a refined and balanced discourse. The concept of universal suffrage was entrenched in many facets of Dr. Singh, L. M. Singhvi's ideology. He was a true friend to one and all, in courts, in parliament, to nations as a diplomat, and to his family too. At its core was his firm belief in the ideology of equality for all members and franchisees of this great nation, with utmost respect for the feminist movement, which also has its direct nexus with the idea of universal adult suffrage. Further, his deep and abiding faith in the idea of collaboration and consensus building in a participative, inclusive, and diverse democracy was everlasting. Today, we have moved far ahead in the 21st century, but the real challenge that lies before us is with regard to the mode and manner in which we put power back into the hands of the people, especially the most marginalized sections of our society. That will truly be transformative. I could go on and on today, but my brief is extremely limited, and I will end by genuinely thanking the Honorable Vice President of India and the Honorable Chief Justice of India for continuing to enlighten us and inspiring millions of lifelong students of law, political science, liberal arts, and history. I want to thank the eminent members of the panel for their brilliance in giving us, giving us something that will remain scribed, not only in our memory, but also hopefully in actionable terms for representatives of the real franchisees of this great nation, its people. I want to thank all our special guests for being with us today. Thank you very much indeed. Thank you, Mr. Singhvi. I request all to please rise for the national anthem. Janagana mana adhinayaka jayahe Bharat bhagya vidhata Punjab, Sindh, Gujarat, Maratha Dravida utkala vanga Vindya himachala yamuna ganga Ujjala jala dhitaranga Tava shubha name jage Tava shubha aashish maage Gahe tava jaya gaga Jana gana mangala dayak jaya he Bharat bhagya vidhata Jaya he, jaya he Jaya He, Jaya 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 He. For more such videos, subscribe to the NewsX YouTube channel. Hit the bell icon.